Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's good to see you, those of you who are not at Lake Michigan today or camping or in various other locales. Am I on? Oh, good, I'm on. That's nice. So I probably don't need the mic because I project very well anyways, but I'll put it on there anyways for all those people that are not here today that might want to listen to it over on uh, iTunes or whatnot, follow along in the podcast. Um, But yeah, thanks for all scooching in here. This is nice, man. Get you all like right here. Hopefully you're not like in the spitting zone here or anything there. Usually you've got a few feet of space between you there. But um, yeah, it's July, um, but we're still gathering as the people of God here to hear from God in his word. And we're in Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, we trust that God has something special for us this morning as we open um, his word. And so Ephesians Chapter 6, I'm going to be reading from verses 10 all the way through 18. The first part of verse 18, and if you want to follow along with me, that would be um, fantastic. So Ephesians, yeah, chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, uh, stand there, or having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you may can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. This is the word of the Lord. And so we have the wonderful opportunity this morning. Not only have we gotten to talk about submission, not only have we gotten to talk about slavery, but today we get to talk about Satan. How's that for an exciting lineup of wonderful topics? Some pretty intense, some pretty heavy, weighty stuff. I think I'm going to need a vacation after handling all of these wonderful, the challenging, difficult texts for us to wrestle with in our context um, today. But seriously, I do appreciate Uh, expository preaching because it keeps me honest, right? I can't just cherry pick all the topics that I want to talk about. I got to talk about what the Bible's talking about. And so we got to talk about things like marriage and parenting and what it means to glorify God and honor him in our work. We got to talk about Satan, even though we're like, Satan? Seriously? Yeah, we got to talk about Satan this morning. So that's going to be really fun. So let me pray um, as we do that and dive into God's word um, this morning that God would be... uh, speaking to us, opening our eyes to the spiritual battle that we are so often oblivious to in our Western culture, living our lives as we do. And so let's pray and we'll dive into God's word this morning. Uh, Father, we pray that you would help us to remember this morning that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers over this present darkness. Help us to remember because we often forget. Father, we struggle to remember that we are in the midst of a cosmic battle between good and evil in which, um, uh, God, we're called to stand firm in the midst of the fight. We're called to put on this armor of God. So would you help us to do that this morning? Would you speak to us through um, your spirit? Uh, Wake us up to the battle that's going on in all of our everyday mundane lives. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are wrapping up our sermon series on Ephesians, establishing our new identity in Christ this week and next. And uh, we can tell that by what Paul says in verse 10, finally. So we're getting to the end of the book. Finally, as the last things to consider, as the last things to think about, as Paul has been unpacking for us this wonderful new identity uh, that we have um, in Christ and how it changes absolutely everything. Uh, everything, he wants to uh, finally, at the end of this epistle, warn his readers about the spiritual battle that is going to take place if you take everything that he has said in the letter thus far 
seriously. And so just a little disclaimer here, if you're um, simply going to let all the apostle Paul said um, in this series go in one ear and out the, out the other ear, don't worry about it. Don't stress about this part of the series. If you don't plan on actually applying anything about what Paul's saying, if you don't plan on loving your wives like Christ loved the church, if you don't plan on um, raising your children, the discipline and instruction of the Lord, if you don't plan on glorifying and honoring God in your work, uh, none of this is going to be really, really that difficult for you, right? Satan has you right where he wants you, on the sidelines, not really engaged in the gospel. So again, this is not really, really that going to be that important to you if you're not planning on actually taking any of this stuff seriously. But on the other hand, if you are serious about living into your new identity in Christ, if you are serious about all that Paul is teaching you in this book, if you really plan on taking this seriously, warning to you, you are about to step into a spiritual battle. If you actually want to try and do the things that Paul is teaching you to do in this book, it's going to get intense. It's going to get difficult. And I realize it's the middle of the summer and you guys are all chill and relaxed and everybody's got shorts on and you're probably heading to the beach afterwards. But, but we really got to think about the spiritual battle that comes into play when we start to step into all that God has for us in this book. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great uh, preacher from uh, in the England in the, earlier in this century, um, said this of this text. I thought it was a beautiful intro. He said, this is a stirring call to battle. Do you not hear the bugle and the trumpet? We are being roused. We are being stimulated. We are being set upon our feet. We are being told to be men. The whole tone is martial. It is manly. It is strong. And so we get a little bit of a wake-up call here at the end of the letter to the battle that's going to happen as we seek to engage in this Christian life, to put on our new identity in Christ. So this morning, I want to look at the enemy um, who's going to try to thwart any of our attempts to actually live out this new identity in Christ, look at the enemy's schemes a little bit more closely, I want to look at the enemy's defeat, and finally, how to stand firm against the enemy. So my aim for this morning's message is that we would be able to stand firm in the face of spiritual warfare. So let's start with the enemy. Now in our um, secular age, uh, we often forget that we're in the midst of a cosmic battle for our souls and the world, right? We just think we're just doing our thing. We're living nice, relaxing, middle-class, white, you know, West Michigan life. You know, things are great. Things are chill. You know, everybody's pretty cool and friendly around here. Michigan nice, you know. You know, we forget like there's a spiritual battle going around, going on around us. And not just Michigan people, but I think Western people in general tend to struggle with the reality of spiritual warfare in the world. Andrew Del Banco, longtime professor at Columbia University in his book, uh, The Death of Satan, How Americans Have Lost the Sense of Evil, uh, does a nice job of setting up the context for our cultural context. He's writing at Columbia University in New York City um, about how as Americans, right, as we've left behind our Christian heritage, this idea of Satan and demons and evil, like now we're really grappling with how do we really describe evil in the world around us. When someone flies planes like into the Twin Towers, when a school shooter opens fire and kills all these combatants, when we see ethnic genocide in Rwanda, or um, we look at some other terrible tragedy uh, around us, right? Um, we talk about things like, you know, mental illness. Um, we talk about things like, um, you know, negative influences from the media and the culture and, you know, We'll, we'll talk about other, you know, ethnic or other fa different psychological factors. And those are all legitimate. They're valid. They're important considerations. But uh, sometimes we really struggle to grapple with just the pure gratuitous uh, of evil in our world, right? We shudder at the mass graves um, uh, that are unearthed on TV, uh, the victims of the latest serial killer or ethnic genocide. But then we just switch the channel, right? It's too uncomfortable for us to consider the real pain and the suffering and brokenness in our world, that there's real evil around us. And we see it every day. I mean, it's not only um, coming at us uh, on the evening news, it's coming at us on our smartphones with push notifications on Twitter and social media all the time, a constant barrage of some of the most horrible, you know, deplorable, you know, gratuitous evil. And we're seeing it just being beamed right into our homes and 
uh, living rooms, and we wonder, as Western people, who are pretty convinced that everyone's pretty much basically good and everyone's being enlightened, and as we get more educated and more affluent, uh, we should all just be getting better and better and better. And we wonder, why are there school shootings? Why is there incredible violence around the world? Why is there still extreme terrorism and stuff like that? We struggle. Um, as a case in point, uh, he quotes a conversation between, interestingly enough, Hannibal Lecter and Officer Starling in the classic book and movie, The Silence of the Lambs. And I thought this quote brought home our struggle as Western people wrestling with evil um, very nicely. The detective asks one of the guards what happened to Hannibal Lecter, this psychologist turned psycho killer. Um, if you've seen the film, you may still have nightmares from it uh, going on, to which the, the prisoner responds, um, nothing happened to me, Officer Starling. I happened. You can't reduce me to a set of influences. You've given up good and evil for behaviorism, Officer Starling. You've got everyone in moral dignity pants. Nothing is ever anybody's fault. Look at me, Officer Starling. Can you stand to say, I'm evil? And so you have this wrestling, and this is what Del Banco says, professor at Columbia, you know, secular guy in one of the most secular institutions in one of the most secular cities. The country said, these words are an epitome of modern horror, the horror of knowing that we cannot answer the monster's question, right? As Western enlightened kind of people today, we struggle with saying, you know, how we even define evil, what is evil, um, what to do with it. The Bible, on the other hand, has no problems calling evil evil. And in our passage today, right, we're confronted with evil, not just as a thing, but as a very personal force, as a group of satanic people, de angels, demons that have fallen uh, from God and are out to wreak havoc on the world. You know, the thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. We're confronted with that reality in our text um, this morning, we see it right there in verse 12, right? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present, um, over this present darkness, over the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so according to the Bible, there is a real devil, right? Who is, is a fallen angel, who has rebelled against God, who is seeking to do as much damage to our souls and to our world as he possibly can. There is a hierarchy in hell. We're not really given a whole lot of information about the rulers, authorities, the cosmic powers, but there are all these different legions of hell that are also seeking to inflict the maximum amount of damage and pain and suffering that they can uh, upon the world, and there was a real historical fall. Adam and Eve were tempted by a real devil to really fall from God, to rebel against God, and unleash all the pain and suffering and misery uh, that we see in the world today. If you read the Bible, as Western people, there are a lot of very surprising things in it to us. Um, obviously, that first account of the serpent deceiving Adam and Eve in the garden, that's a little bit disturbing to us, but we also see Jesus, if you're reading through the Gospels, um, casting out demons as part of his ministry, this ministry of exorcism, setting people free. So if you're reading the gospel accounts, you're gonna see over and over again, not only is he healing people, he's also casting out demons. You know, we go, wow, that's surprising. Jesus is doing a lot of other wonderful things, but one of the things that he does throughout his ministry is cast out demons. See the apostles doing the same thing in the book of Acts, right? As people are oppressed by evil spirits, um, under the control of satanic forces, the apostles are casting them out, setting people free, um, bringing them into the full of Christ. Um, and of course, as we go throughout this series, as with so many of these topics, we see that Ephesus was one of the epicenters for the occult. So much occult activity was going on in this city. If you flip with me back to Acts chapter 19, uh, we get a wonderful little snippet of this, or I should say wonderful, because it's kind of probably surprising or shocking would be a better adjective for that. Um, but we get a glimpse into the spiritual warfare that was going on in this ancient City And so in chapter 19, Acts 19, verse 11, we're here in Ephesus, and uh, here's the kind of spiritual activity that's going on in this city. And um, we read, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hand of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that he touched, his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. So that's surprising. There are evil spirits being cast out by a mere handkerchief. That's pretty impressive. And then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. So you had a group of exorcists hanging around. This is a little bit different for us, right? This is not West Michigan. There's probably not a group of Jewish exorcists hanging around the city looking for demons to cast out, okay? But this is what they're doing. They undertook to invoke 
the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirits answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered them all, overpowered them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And that's not even the end of the count. This just keeps going. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, which as we know is a massive center of the occult. And like, whoa, there's like spiritual warfare going on. So both Jews and Greeks, on all the residents of Ephesus, so both Jews and Greeks, uh, and a fear fell upon them all, and the name of Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found it came out to 50,000 pieces of silver. This is millions of dollars in our current, like this is a massive, this is not like, you know, 12 guys got together and burned their like, you know, their old, you know, ACDC records here. Like, I mean, this is like millions and millions of dollars of like, you know, the occult materials here. So this like effect would have affected literally the economy of the city of Ephesus. And so in verse 20 we read, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Like spiritual warfare, like it was getting real there in Ephesus. It was intense. I mean, demons are like beating people up, like cult scrolls are being, I mean, this is, this is wild and crazy stuff, but this is what is going on. This is what we read in our Bible. This is what was happening in the world of Ephesus, the culture that Paul is talking to. Um, like this battle was not like, you know, behind closed doors. I mean, this battle was in their face, like Satan worshiping the occult. I mean, it was everywhere. Um, ubiquitous in that culture, like TV or electricity in our world today. And so this all sounds like crazy, like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs in our Western context today, right? We're like, what? Like, do we really believe this stuff? I mean, this is insane. Uh, but in the rest of the world, and if you travel to South America, Africa, or Asia, um, this kind of spiritual warfare is not as surprising as you would think. If you talk to people growing up in some of these cultures, they go, no, this is part of what it looks like to grow up in those areas. There's real witch doctors in parts of the world today. There's real occult practices going on in various areas of the world today. Really dangerous sort of stuff. So people in other parts of the world are nodding their heads and then people in here in the West are like, whoa, this is totally weird. This is beyond, this is bizarre. Um, and because we're not seeing this kind of obvious demonic activity, um, we may be tempted to think that Satan is not very active in our culture. But this is to radically underestimate the work of Satan. And so what I want to do is spend in one sense, uh, the rest of the sermon, showing, maybe pulling back the curtain, if I could, perhaps for you, on Satan's work here in our culture today. And so I want to look at the Satan's schemes. He's real. He's a real person. He has real demons working for him. He's trying to wreak real havoc. He really wants to steal, kill, and destroy uh, as many people as he can, destroy as many relationships as he can. And let's look a little bit more closely at his schemes, how he does that today. Uh, particularly um, in our culture. I think in our common cultural image of the devil, he's kind of like a red guy with a pitchfork, and it's kind of so absurd, it's kind of hard to take seriously. Like, he looks like a comic book character or something. We're kind of like, it's almost laughable in our culture. And I think our understanding of satanic activity is so colored by horror movies where people are like, you know, eyes are bugging out of their heads and like they're freaking out and their heads are spinning around or something crazy like that, that we think, well, clearly there's nothing satanic happening in our lives or our areas, um, but we need to understand here the most important thing to stand, understand about the devil is that he is a liar. The verbal form of diabolos literally means liar, accuser. What Satan primarily does is not like zap people, take them over and dwell them and do crazy, bizarre things. Um, what he does is lie. He loves to deceive people. Jesus said to the Pharisees in John eight forty four, you are of your father, the devil, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. So if you want to see satanic activity, all you have to look for is, not all you have to look for, there's other things you can look for too, but one of the things you can look for is lies because that's his primary mode of operation. And he's been perfecting it ever since the garden when he tempted Adam and Eve. He has lots of experience with it. This is why Paul warns us of the devil's schemes. This word schemes means his strategies. He has different tactics that he is using. Um, and Paul's going to get some military language for tempting us, deceiving us, uh, overcoming us in various 
um, ways. And he has two basic strategies. C.S. Lewis uh, opens his famous screw tape letters this way. If you haven't read the screw tape letters, highly recommend it. It's a really entertaining read uh, about demonic strategy and temptation in our lives. But this is what Lewis says. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils or about the demons. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So in the Ephesian culture, Satan had clearly opted for the former strategy, right? An obsessive interest in the occult. You know, millions of dollars worth of occult scrolls. I mean, they were like just a few like Ouija boards. Like, I mean, they had like bought the whole store. I mean, they had everything occult um, you could possibly imagine. But in our culture today, he likes the other strategy. Let's do the materialist thing. People that don't believe in a spiritual world, a supernatural world. There's nothing beyond what our eyes can see, what science can perceive and test. Because science is real, right? And that's all there is. That's all. If you can't test it, if you can't quantify it, it doesn't exist. It's not real. And that is another wonderfully effective strategy of Satan. So how does this actually work in practice? If Satan loves to exploit both an obsession with the demonic or try to pretend that he doesn't exist at all and that all there is the material, what are some of the things he likes to exploit? Well, well, the armor of God alerts us to some of our chief vulnerabilities. Paul is going to give us a set of armor because he wants to protect us against our chief vulnerabilities, the ways Satan is going to go after us. So, so Paul tells us, first of all, to put on the belt of truth because Satan's primary strategy is to spread falsehood. He's the father of lies. And so if you get all of your information from Fox News, right, or, or CNN, right, be careful, right? If your main source of truth um, is all the different cable news stations that are beaming in stuff to you that are trying to get you to buy a certain tagline or a certain political line, you know, beware. Satan is the father of lies. He's the father of fake news. That's what he specializes in. Distortions, falsehoods, twisting the truth. This is Satan's specialty, right? He specializes in fake news. Paul tells us to put on the breast prayer of righteousness because Satan will constantly be reminding us that we aren't good enough, right? That we don't measure up, that we're failures, that we're never going to get to heaven, we're never good enough to make it to heaven, um, that we don't have it in and of ourselves. He's constantly going to go after our righteous, attacking our status, telling us we're not good enough, telling us we're failures. That's where he's going to go for. He's going to go for uh, the jugular. Paul tells us to put on shoes for our feet, readiness given by the gospel of peace, because he's const- Satan is constantly questioning the relevance of the gospel for our lives. And what's all this talk about gospel-centered life and gospel this, gospel? You don't need the gospel. It's not, it's not important for your life. It's not important for your coworkers. It's not important for your kids. It's not important for your family. What do you need the gospel for? Just, just, just dismiss that. Get that out of your lives, right? Paul tells us, take up the shield of faith. Why? Because Satan is constantly sowing doubt, skepticism, cynicism into our hearts. He's constantly trying to undermine the truth of the gospel. Paul tells us to put on the helmet of salvation because Satan will constantly be questioning our salvation. I don't know how many times as a kid I like walked the aisle to get saved again because I didn't know if it stuck yet, right? So that's, that's satanic activity, questioning your salvation. Are you really a child of God? I mean, the things you think about, the things you watch, the things you desire, the things you're interested in, how could you possibly be a child of God? How could you possibly? That's Satan, right? Sowing those lies into your mind. Um, and he loves, of course, Paul tells us, take up the sword of the Spirit and pray because Satan's going to be questioning the word of God. He's going to be trying to keep us from prayer. That's, these are all satanic strategies here. And so the armor really helps us, alerts us to our chief uh, vulnerabilities. But let me give you a few even more practical illustrations of how Satan ob- um, often operates from Thomas Brooks's classic, Precious Remedies Against Satan's devices. And so this is a wonderful bit of pastoral work from a 16th century Puritan pastor who's trying to bring this down even more. So don't tell me Mike never does practical sermons because I want to give you some practical, these are practical ways in which the devil works his schemes. And I, because you say the devil, come on, Mike, seriously, this is the 21st century. We don't even believe he exists. He, here are some ways in which his schemes actually work themselves out by a wise pastor counseling his flock. And I highly recommend you pick it up. It's a great little book. Um, he just goes through about 50 different devices of the devil and then God's remedies to that. So as a pastor, he's like, here's how Satan will tempt you. Here's how you can apply the truths of the gospel to fight him. So device number one, 
Satan's first device to draw the soul into sin is to present the bait and hide the hook, to present the gold cup and hide the poison, to present the sweet, the pleasure, the profit that may flow in upon the soul by yielding to sin and hide the wrath and misery that will certainly follow the committing of sin. How's that for some wise pastoral wisdom? You maybe heard that before. Um, that's, that's pastoral wisdom that's been around for a while, right? That's Satan's oldest strategy in the book. That's how we got Adam and Eve in the garden, right? You know, he gave him that hook there, like you could be like God, knowing good and evil. Wouldn't you want that? And then uh, without any indication that knowing good and evil by that means, um, stealing it by eating the forbidden fruit, by acquiring that knowledge in that way would only be accompanied by misery, uh, which has followed us all the way down to the present age. Satan's strategies, right? The hook is really shiny. It's pretty. Just bite onto it, you know, hiding all of the consequences of our sin, right? We know that works, right? We've all been there. We've done that. We, we've followed our desires, we've followed our hearts into some wonderful thing and only to find later, right, that, that there was a hook, right, and there was misery that accompanied that. So, so second thing, by getting us to rationalize sin as virtue. This is good, isn't it? Rationalize sin as virtue. We do this, right? I'm not gossiping, I'm just sharing prayer requests, right? I'm not being a jerk, I'm just being prophetic, you know? I'm not being cheap, I'm just a good steward of the resources God has given us, right? Isn't it incredible how our minds rationalize, right? We'll, we'll turn something, you know, that's sinful and we'll somehow turn it around in our minds so we're now virtuous, right? And Satan is the master of doing that, like taking our vices and going, oh no, they're actually virtues. Like you're actually really a wonderful person. And that's the way Satan's schemes work, by showing, uh, by helping us, getting us to rationalize sin as virtue. How about number three, by showing us the sins of Christian leaders. This is a really effective one, right? Because if all those Christian leaders are falling into sin or affairs or stealing money, I mean, certainly I'm off the hook, right? I mean, if the pastors are sitting and struggling, well, clearly God's gonna excuse whatever I'm doing because, you know, I'm not on that level or that plane, right? And that's some very effective strategy. I mean, all the, you know, all the fairs and scandals that are happening all over the world and country, I mean, Satan just loves to get those out in the headlines. And then the normal folks are kind of like, yeah, I well, guess we're off the hook. Um, how about number four, by overstressing the mercy of God, right? God will forgive me. That's his job, right? So I can sin, and do whatever I want, right? Get in any trouble I want. I mean, you know, live the life, party, do whatever, because God's going to forgive me. That's what he does. That's God's job. Um, how about a couple of, by making us bitter over suffering. Oh, this is a great one, right? You know, I've suffered so much, you know, you know, no one knows how much I've suffered. You know, I deserve to be able to do this little sin, this little indulgence, this little thing here because I've struggled so much. I should be able, I'm entitled to X, Y, Z. And, and the list goes on and on and on. There's, there's a ton of these here. I'm probably not gonna read them all because it would be really crazy. But a couple more. By, by showing us how many non-Christians have seemingly wonderful lives, right? I mean, look at those wonderfully happy, well-adjusted people that don't have Jesus in their lives. Why bother? Like, why even do this whole Christian thing? Satan says, you know, look at their lives. Look at how happy they are. Look at how rich they are. They're all at the beach this morning, and you're here in church, you know? What are you doing? I mean, you should be out there relaxing, taking it easy, you know? It's easy kind of stuff to do, right? You know? And so on and on it goes, and I could list, you know, many more illustrations. He's got, like, 50 of them or something. Um, but he also has, those are temptations. He also has accusations. So the temptations cause us to kind of like think of ourselves really well. I, I can do this. I'm good. I'm cool. I can, I can fall for these temptations. He also has accusations, which are far more damaging, destructive, like ways that he just seeks to just bring us down, like in really toxic ways. Um, and the first way he does this um, device one is by causing saints to remember their sins more than their savior. This is one of Satan's favorite strategies, okay? You, you know you're under satanic attack if all you can remember is the sins that just kept flashing before your eyes instead of your savior. If you're constantly, Satan is constantly flashing on all the ways you've failed, all the ways you don't measure up, all the thoughts that are impure. Right? If those things are all that are flashing into your mind, all you're thinking about is your sin more than your savior, you know you are under satanic attack right at that point because that's Satan's favorite strategy loves to do it, loves to remind people more of their sin and their Savior. And so um, I always tell people pastorally when I'm counseling them, you know, the words of a great um, 
uh, Scottish Presbyterian pastor Robert Murray McShane, for every one you know, look you take at your own heart, take 10 looks to Christ, right? Because we can get lost in the introspection and the sin and the struggles and questioning our motives and our desires. And so uh, I always love to point people, Satan will tell you, take 10 looks at your sin and don't look at Christ at all. You know, the gospel tells us, take 10 looks at your savior and take um, for every look you're taking into your own heart. A um, couple of other things. By causing us to obsess over past sin, sins that have done damage that can't be undone, right? That's another very damning way the devil loves to work on us. Let me just continue to keep you thinking and reflecting over the sins that you've done that have done damage to other people and they're ongoing that you can't do anything about. Just dwell in that pain and the suffering and the hardship. Satan loves to just love us just stay there in that place uh, of looking over our past sins or our past life and the damage that was done. Um, there by th- making us think that the troubles, here's the third one, by making us think that the troubles we are going through must be punishments, right? Gosh, you know, I'm going through a really tough time in my life right now. This is a really hard season. God must be punishing me. God must hate me. God must really not like me, right? That's another satanic accusation. You're going through a difficult time. God may be refining you. God may be growing you. God may be building your faith. God may be doing any number of things. I mean, God's always doing 10,000 things at any moment in our lives. And we're a mayor of maybe, you know, one or two of them. But Satan's always like, nope, nope, God hates you. That's why your life is so miserable. You must not even be a Christian. You should just go, whatever. <laughs> that's, the, that's Satan. Those are the words of Satan. Uh, once again, two more. Um, by making us think that the inner doubts and struggles that we were having could not be had by true Christians. Have you ever been there? You kind of wonder about, you hear something about the Bible or you hear something about God or evil and you go, dude, I, I don't know, man, that really makes me question like Christianity, you know, some of those issues and you just go, I can't be a Christian. Clearly Christians could never have doubts or fears or questions about the Bible or hell or whatever your favorite topic might be. That's satanic. That's a satanic scheme, right? You think, oh, I couldn't have those doubts. I couldn't have those struggles. I couldn't have those questions. Satan loves to work that way. Oh yeah, Satan's aren't, oh, Christians aren't allowed, real Christians aren't allowed to have doubts or fears or struggles. Nonsense. That is a satanic strategy that he is using on us. And let me just give you one more. There's tons more. You can go look them up in the book. Um, But these are really helpful because they begin to help see how Satan works in your life. Some of the strategies he will continue to use on you until you get wise to them, until you stand against them. He's going to keep using these on you. And he will just pummel you with them, demoralize you, discourage you, keep you in doubt and fear and depression as long as he possibly can. Uh, But one last one, which is probably in some ways the most tragic, and uh, that Satan will say, by suggesting to sinners that Christ is unwilling to save them. Right? Have you ever been there? Right? Just so discouraged, demoral. It's like God clearly is just not even interested in me. He's done with me. He's just thrown me off here because of I've done this, I've done that, or I've been in habitual sin, or there have been struggles in my life, or I'm looking at my past. And Christ is clearly not willing to save me. Right? That's satanic again that the mercies of Christ cannot extend as we've already prayed to our sins, past, present, future. The Satan will lie. He said, no, you're disqualified. And so there are so many strategies that Satan uses to demoralize us, to depress us, to uh, undermine our confidence in Christ and our salvation. I hope you're beginning to appreciate how subtle and deceptive Satan can be, okay? It's not just the weird dudes on horror movies that are like bugging out and like, you know, freaking out and their eyes are popping out of their heads and, you know, they're speaking in really weird psycho voices. Like, no, Satan uses very subtle temptations, very subtle lies to get you to question your standing before God, um, his love for you, and in so many subtle ways, Satan is working to steal your joy um, that you have. And so thankfully, uh, we aren't in this fight alone. It's a fight, right? It's a struggle. Satan is throwing everything he has at us, um, but we are not alone. The prophet Isaiah tells us that God himself fights for us. And this is the good news. This is the wonderful turn um, in the sermon where we're seeing God step in to fight on our behalf. We're not in this battle alone. So Isaiah 55, 15 through 20, I love this because this is God himself putting on the armor to go and fight for us. And Isaiah 15, 59, 15, Isaiah says, the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice, that there was evil in the world, that all the, the sin and corruption. Uh, then his own arm brought him salvation. His righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. 
Um, and it says down in verse 20, interestingly enough, and a, re- a redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from transgression to declares the Lord. Isaiah is reminding his people that God fights for them and that he will send a redeemer to finally win the war. Right? God himself straps on the armor. God himself steps into the battle to fight on behalf of his people. But he promises us, intriguingly in this text, that he's gonna send a redeemer, one to come to ultimately rescue us from all the schemes of the devil. And we see the first skirmish in this cosmic battle in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, right? As Jesus is led off into the wilderness um, to be tempted by Satan. We know, of course, because we've gone over the last couple weeks over and over again, Adam and Eve were tempted in this lush, rich, paradisical garden. They had everything they could possibly want um, before them. And Satan is brought along to tempt them With this one tree, the one thing that God is withholding from them, this knowledge of good and evil for their good, and he tempts them with that one thing. But here we see the second Adam brought into the wilderness. He's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. You know, everything has been stripped away from him and the tempter comes to test this second Adam to see if he will stand against the fight. And so Satan brings his temptations on one one at a time. You know, turn this, you know, these stones into bread. And Jesus says, no, answers each response with the word of God. And then he says, throw yourself off the temple and your angels will protect him. And Jesus says, don't put, don't put the Lord to the test. And then finally standing before him in the final temptation, just like Adam and Eve, you could have it all. I'll give you the whole world. Everything could be yours if you only bow down and worship me. Same temptation, right, that Satan pitched to Adam in the garden, but the second Adam standing in the wilderness, um, 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, hungry, alone, vulnerable, stands against the devil, quotes the word of God, parries every thrust of the devil with the sword of, that is the word of God, quotes scripture back to Satan uh, and is victorious and prevails. Uh, And of course, that's just the first skirmish, right? We know that this battle is going on between Satan and Jesus throughout the Gospels. Jesus at one point, as demons are being cast outside, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. And, and so the victory is moving forward. Jesus talks about the strong man being bound, but Jesus' ultimate victory will come at the cross. In Colossians 2, 13 through 15, Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, and God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demand. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, and he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. You see what Paul is saying? At the cross, Jesus triumphed over Satan and sin and death. All the rulers, all the powers, all the authorities that had a claim on us because of our sin, because of the sin of Adam, that original sin in our lives and the sin that we continue to live in and walk in, all of it nailed to the cross. Any claim that Satan has on us, his demons have on us, has been nailed to the cross. Jesus has triumphed. Here in uh, the book of Ephesians, back in 1, 16 through 21, Andrew Kishner preached on this a few weeks back or a few months back. Paul wants us to remember the immeasurable. This is verse Ephesians 1, 16 through 21. Paul wants us to remember the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that is to be named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Jesus triumphed on the cross. Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of the Father over all the rulers, the powers, the authorities, anything that could stand against us. He reigns victorious. John probably said it the most succinctly in his first epistle. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. That's what Jesus has come to do. He's come to do battle with Satan on our behalf, to put on the full armor of God, to defeat Satan in ways that the first Adam could never do, to stand in our place as the second Adam and perfectly confront the devil. We don't have to win the war. Jesus has already done that. We just have to stand firm in the armor of God until Satan and his demons are finally vanquished in the last battle. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that relaxing? Like, we don't have to defeat Satan, right? He's already been defeated at the cross. We have to stand firm in our faith. As the 
continual work of defeating all of the works of the devil are continued. As the church continues to advance and the gates of hell are thrown down and more people are brought into the kingdom of life, we get to stand firm. That's what Jesus is doing. I I love this. Sinclair Ferguson said this early in the Christian life. We might think that to stand in this spiritual warfare is a relatively insignificant achievement. When we're standing, I mean, shouldn't we be like charging or like doing some awesome thing, like, charging, like you know, just standing in our faith, you know, is that, that a pretty uh, insignificant achievement? No, the pressure of spiritual warfare, the more clearly we see uh, that to remain standing after all the heat of battle is the result of work of supernatural grace in us. This is why Paul reiterates the idea. He's going back to it continually. He says it in verse 11, which I'm going to flip back over to, um, chapter six, verse 11. He's saying, you know, put on the whole armor of God so you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And then in verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. In verse 14, stand again. We are called to make this stand. And Paul was very familiar with the Roman military. He had the opportunity to travel with a Roman centurion. Acts 27, he was currently chained to a Roman soldier. So you see in verse 20, and he knew that the Roman phalanx was virtually impenetrable. I think I have a picture of this up here on the screen. You pop that up there, Johnny. Um, when, sh- when the soldiers stood shoulder to shoulder together, covered by their massive shields, which is the kind of shield that's listed in this passage, it was almost impossible to break their formation. Do you love this? This was kind of popularized in the movie 300, too, if you saw that one as well, right? These These soldiers gathered together, their huge shields around them, standing toe-to-toe, shoulder-to-shoulder. You know, there was no way to break that kind of formation. You know, the Roman Empire conquered the entire known world using that tactics in Alexander the Great and the Greeks before them, you know, because they understood with modern warfare, if each soldier stood shield-to-shield right next to each other with those shields covering them, the flaming arrows that would, were actually a large part of ancient warfare, they'd take arrows, put pitch on them, light them on fire, and would wreak havoc. But if you have this shield wall in front of you and you have a soldier standing on either side of you with this shield, you're imp- impervious to attack. You could stand firm, but you get the importance of standing here, right? If, if you're not standing, if somebody runs the other direction, you now have a gigantic hole in that shield wall. Everyone's vulnerable. If you don't stand together, right, with those shields of faith held up, right, you're, you're vulnerable to attack. And so Paul, knowing this Roman military tactics, know how it has conquered the entire ancient world, he's like calling us together to use this military um, analogy here for our church to say, look, we gotta, we gotta gather together. We gotta put on the armor of God. We've gotta stand shoulder to shoulder together in the gospel uh, against the Satan's defenses and Watch him continue to work in our lives. I love the imagery. I love the military stuff. I get a little nerded out on that stuff. But it's pretty exciting for me to think about as a church how we are called to stand together in faith, together, shoulder to shoulder, in the gospel against Satan's attacks. And, and Paul recognized, look, we're, we're in a pretty good place if we're in that. If we're out on our own, right, that's where we're vulnerable, right? Where, we're, where sin usually takes us. Sin wants, wants a man to be alone, out there struggling, suffering on their own. But it's in community, right, where you're shoulder to shoulder with other believers, right? There's defense, there's safety, there's encouragement, uh, all the good things of the gospel. So just a little plug for community there. You you need people around you, right, holding you up, encouraging you, supporting you. So a couple other things just uh, in by way of closing here. Um, What would it look like if we actually live this out Monday morning? How do you actually live into this struggle that we're in, this call to fight against the devil in our, to stand against the devil in our everyday lives. So Paul tells us to put on the belt of truth. Um, Are you getting a daily diet of truth? Um, And I don't have enough time. There's so much content here. So cool. I'd love to spend a lot of time on each of the elements, but just by way of quick exhortations here, are you getting a daily diet of truth, right? Are you in God's word every day, you know, absorbing the truth out of it? Are you reading good books, listening to good podcasts, Uh, checking out good blogs? Are you constantly getting a good source of truth in your life? Because the world is bombarding truths at us every day. It's just constantly coming at us, smartphones, TVs, computers. You know, we need to be immersing ourselves in the truth. Paul tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Are we resting in Christ's righteousness? Are we trying to establish our own, right? If we're constantly insecure, constantly, am I doing enough? Am I done enough? 
Like, you know, or am I looking to Christ, right? Paul's saying, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Your standing is in Christ, what he has done for you. He has perfectly triumphed over the devil. He has been victorious. He has paid for all of our sins. Don't let the devil continue to accuse you based on past sins in your life and present struggles or future struggles that might come down the road. We need to be established securely in Christ's righteousness. Paul tells us to put on shoes for your feet, the gospel of peace. Are you preaching the gospel to yourselves daily and reminding yourselves and others around you? Every day, Satan wants nothing more than the gospel to be shut down. He doesn't want you to be sharing it with yourself, with your coworkers, with your family, with your kids. Um, This has got to be part of our everyday rhythms of life. Paul tells us to take up the shield of faith. Are we learning daily trust in God and his promises regardless of circumstances right now, regardless of what happens to be going on in our lives? Are we putting up that shield of faith, learning what it means to trust God. And finally, um, or two more, Paul tells us to put on the helmet of salvation, right? Do we have the assurance, uh, the freedom and confidence that comes from knowing that we're saved, right? Or are we constantly wrestling with our salvation? Am I really saved? Am I really there? I know there's years of struggle for that in my own life. If you're in that place where it's like, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I don't know if I have assurance. I don't know if I'm really there. Love to talk to you about that because there's an incredible freedom that comes from just going, I'm saved. Jesus has grabbed a hold of me once and for all, and Jesus is not going to let me go. It's incredible confidence that comes um, out of that. And then finally, Paul tells us to take up the sword of the Spirit, praying at all times to the Spirit. Are we doing it? Are we using Scripture against Satan? Jesus, man, every temptation Satan throws at him, he's got Scripture to throw right back at him. Are we using the Word of God? Are we praying in the Spirit at all times? Satan wants nothing more than to destroy your prayer life. You know, he, he knows that a prayerless Christian is pretty much a impotent Christian, right? A Christian that's not really going anywhere. So he is throwing everything at that. So I want to close uh, today, um, wrap this sermon up here in Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, um, because I thought it really helped land the plane really nicely as we think about the temptations and struggles of our lives and as we move towards this um, communion meal where we celebrate the Lord's Supper, what Jesus has done for us. I, I thought this set it up wonderfully. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so my heart for our church is that we would be able to stand firm in the grace and mercy of Jesus because he's already won the war. And we'd be able to stand together with our brothers and sisters in Christ here in in what he's doing in the world and the advance of the gospel here in the city. So let me pray that God would do that for us uh, this morning. Father, thank you so much for um, Jesus. We thank you that he's won the war, that he has taken on Satan and all of his schemes and defeated him at the cross. Uh, We thank you for all of our sins are also nailed to that cross with Jesus. uh, And so that we stand now in his righteousness and the just the freedom and confidence and joy that comes with that. I pray that we would experience that very much this morning as we gather around your table, um, that we as a community would just be able to stand firm together in our faith, um, uh, that we'd be able to continue to encourage each other uh, in the midst of the battles, the temptations, the struggles, the challenges that Satan is going to throw at us. Um, Would you continue to build this church? Would it continue to advance? Um, against the the gates of hell and destroy them, bring people into the freedom uh, that we have in you. We pray it all in Jesus' name, amen.